Welcome to the next question. I'm Austin. I'm Chi Chi. I'm Jenny. So Austin, who is joining us today? Today we have Nicole Hannah Jones. Mm, yes. I can't even believe it. <laughs> she is an investigative reporter for the New York Times, a MacArthur Genius Award winner, co-founder of the Ida B. Wells Society. She has done the um, curation for the mm. 1619 yes. Project for the New York Times Magazine. Basically, she's who I want to be. Yeah. Yeah. The resident badass. Yeah. I want to be her when I grow up. Right. And I really love this conversation because I felt like it, well, first of all, she's a wealth of information. Mm -hmm. I mean, I learned so much, but I love the way that um, we were able to talk about education and the history behind that and really how that intersects with racial justice. Because I think, I don't know that you can talk about racial justice without talking about education because right. they're so closely intertwined. Right. So. Yeah, I really love this conversation a lot. Yeah, I think she does a like masterful job of taking things that feel like just like you'd be reading about it in a historical textbook yeah. and weaving it with like personal narrative and research and her journalism background. And it's just, it becomes like, you kind of get swept up in the story and it becomes like, this is, um, it doesn't feel historical. It feels like yeah. today and that we yeah. need to do something today. So I really felt like once she kicked all of our asses and got us <laughs> just thinking about things in a really like unique way, yeah. Um, and then one of my favorite parts of the conversation was actually about like self-care for black women. Yes. Like that was like a really, there was like some vulnerability that I think we saw a side of her that maybe she's not, um, yeah, so used to sharing. So I really love that we got kind of like, uh, we got kind of both sides of her and that was really special. I'm also really proud that we just got her to drink a ton of bourbon. Yes. Yeah. She I feel <laughs> like we're like sisters in that. And yeah, she tried to get us drunk and I'm not mad at it. Right. I'm not mad at it at all. So are we ready? Let's do it. Let's ask the next question. Uh, you won the MacArthur Genius Award for chronicling um, the persistence of racial segregation in education. So tell us a little bit about this. I mean, I'm still wowed by the fact that you're a genius. Um, but <laughs> so am I. <laughs> what, how, so how do you become a genius? I know you don't apply for this. I mean, I feel like if you did, I probably would have tried, even though I got would get denied. But um, how do you become a genius? What was your what was your journey to this point? Well. Um, my father's sperm met my mother's <laughs> egg. Mm -hmm. uh, that was that was the, that, yeah. that, all right. That was the beginning of the journey in 1975. Um, no, I, you know, I, I don't know. I it's fun when people like call you a genius, but clearly I, I'm not a genius. I don't I don't know what that even means. But um, the process is. I didn't even know this existed until ta won it mm -hmm. a few years before me. I had never mm -hmm. heard of the MacArthur Genius Award. You know, I'm a, um, I was, I'm a newspaper journalist for most of my career, so the only thing I ever wanted to win was a Pulitzer, which I have not won. Um, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is wood. Hold on. Uh, but, yeah, I, I never wow. expected I mean, I couldn't expect something I didn't even know existed. Right. Um, but also, I mean, I just, my work is on a subject that even very progressive people don't really want to deal with. So mm -hmm. um, I, I've been surprised that anyone has cared about my work in general, mm -hmm. frankly. When I think the award speaks to your work because there's such a, you do such an amazing job of weaving the personal story in with these like, really hard facts and so it's almost like you can't look away from it when you're listening when you're reading so where did that specific lens how did that start to develop in your life like when did you start to experience that way of looking at the world I mean I think all journalists are storytellers mm -hmm. so we're all understanding and particularly when you do investigative reporting that you are largely reporting on things that people either rather would choose to ignore <laughs> or that are really difficult for people. And so we're always thinking of how do we make a personal connection mm -hmm. to the reader? How do we draw someone into um, a story that they'd rather avoid? And so I think that's just kind of naturally what we do. I'm very aware that to get Americans who in general 
aren't that fond of history and certainly uh, have a little interest in the history of racism in this country that I have to tell a very, very compelling story in order to get people to sit sit through that. Um, so I just spend a lot of time thinking about that. And I love writing. Um, as we listen to your work and read your work, I feel like one of the hurdles we keep you know, running into, and you talk a lot about this, is resource hoarding. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we saw it in the story with American Life. We, you know, there are examples of it. We see it when we look at redlining and, you know, the issues with like our property taxes and even the segregation of, of housing. Um, what do you really think is driving this, you know, this desire to hoard resources rather than to embrace this more of like public, um, I think you I think you wrote about this and talked about the social contract um, instead of moving towards that and because we can look at all the the obvious things but what do, what do you feel is really driving that and causing people to move away from that or run away from it in some cases yeah so it's it's a lot of things I mean one I think in general human nature is to fight for advantage mm -hmm. and human nature particularly when it comes to your kids I mean this is why schools are so fraught it is even people if you if you weren't in a country built on slavery, if you weren't in a country built on racism, I think it's just normal for most people to try to get whatever they can get for their kids. Right. Um, then layer on top of that, you know, 400 years of history of this country. So I've actually been uh, thinking a lot about this as I'm, as I'm working on my book. Um, and I've been reading uh, quite a bit on whiteness as, as property. Mm -hmm. And that whiteness in, in and of itself is the opportunity or the resource that you can hoard. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at setting up segregation, mm -hmm. yeah, segregation was about uh, maintaining a system of, uh, of being able to materially extract things from black communities and hoard actual tangible resources to white communities, but it also was about safeguarding the property and the value of whiteness. Mm -hmm. And the saying that whiteness in and of itself will cause your property values to be higher, will cause your schools to get better funding. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's both uh, a guarding of these schools are the best schools, these schools are the schools that uh, attract the most powerful people in a community, the person who could write the uh, recommendation to Harvard for you, or the person who can get you an internship at the New York Times. Mm -hmm. But it also is about maintaining the value of whiteness and whiteness as, as its own separate and distinct property. Um, mm -hmm. And when we talk about the social contract, we have to understand, so black people were not citizens of this country right. until the 14th Amendment. 14th Amendment, uh, which comes in 1866, grants black people citizens of a country that they had lived in since 1619. Mm. Black people were not intended to be part of the social contract right. because we were not considered part of the body politic. And if you look at even the language around that, as, as the, the framers and, and the founding fathers are drafting, you know, the Declaration of Independence, when they're drafting, uh, when, they're, when they're meeting about the Constitutional Convention and determining the rights of, of citizens, and when they're saying that, you know, we are all born with these inalienable rights and that this is a country built on individual rights of all citizens, mm -hmm the way that they can justify the hypocrisy of the fact that one fifth of the population was in bondage was to say that they are not citizens. Mm -hmm. So what you then see is as we set up our public institutions, there is very high support for it. Public institutions, as long as black people are not part of that public. Mm -hmm. And you can actually trace a very clear trajectory from the civil rights movement when black people now by law for the first time are getting access, legal access to public goods. Mm -hmm the erosion of white support for public goods. Mm -hmm. So this is when you see uh, white scale white withdrawal from public schools. Mm -hmm. Public hospitals all of a sudden are a dirty word and those are for the poor, black and brown. Uh, public transportation, we stop mm -hmm. investing in public transportation. Public parks, you see a huge rise in uh, white people building swimming pools in their backyards mm -hmm. so that they can privatize all of these institutions. Um, private golf courses. You see the rise in all of these private institutions as soon as black people now legally mm. get access to the space. Mm. So when we look now about the way we talk about education and how we rarely ever talk about education anymore as a common good, mm -hmm. we talk right. about education now as a consumer good, yeah. <clears throat> right? right? We use market terminology, mm -hmm. you need to shop for me, you need to tell me why I should come to your school. I should be able to pick. I should be able to tell you. Uh, you should be able to select out a bunch of kids who I don't feel I want my child around. Um, and we want schools that are going to build you know, future 
millionaires or that will get my kid into Harvard. We're not talking about public schools as building good citizens anymore mm -hmm. or as helping us to exercise our rights in a democratic society. We don't talk about it that anymore. And that's because black folks are now allowed access to those goods. And so that hoarding that we see is trying to maintain those same rigid caste and mm -hmm. class lines of before mm -hmm. and understanding that to this day, uh, white kids draw resources that black and brown kids simply don't. Right. And I think we're just seeing, you know, it's not okay anymore to say that. Right. Mm -hmm. So now we just say it's about the test scores mm -hmm. of the school, mm -hmm. right? Or I'm worried about the behavior of mm -hmm. the kids in the school. But what the research shows is that the number one driver of white parents in choosing public schools in a, in a diverse city is race, and particularly mm -hmm. black. Mm -hmm. um, and so they'll say they're choosing schools on academics, but what the research actually shows is that they would choose a um, lower scoring, mm -hmm. heavily white school mm -hmm. over a higher scoring, heavily black school. So race is really the driver. It's just that there's not often times where the, the majority black school is scoring higher on test scores, so you don't it's, it's easier to camouflage. This is really helpful because so often white folks think of themselves or speak of themselves as individuals, mm -hmm. of as it opposed to a white community right. that is building private pools right. and defunding mm -hmm. public transportation and participating in white flight yeah. and, yeah. right? But um, conversations like this, mm -hmm help me wrap my mind around how white community has managed to still operate as right. community as, right. without ever speaking about that community. Right, I mean, when you're the default, you don't have to speak right. about it. Right. And when everything in society has been oriented around you and right. your success, um, and, and again, it's not saying there's not a single white person who has struggled, that's not the point. Right. The point is that society though has right. been mm -hmm. oriented around that success. Mm -hmm. You don't have to think about yourself right. in terms of a group. Black people, on the other hand, I mean, literally from the moment we landed here, right. we're not allowed to be right. individuals. Right. Everything about our lives was constrained by us being assigned a race. Everything, mm -hmm. where we could live, if, well, one, if we could even be a free person or right, not. Right. Could we vote? Would right. the laws protect us? Right. Could we marry? Yeah. Uh, could we go to school? Where could we live? Where could we work? Uh, there was nothing, I mean, I, I, for my, for my book research, I just got books on all of the laws passed against black people. I wanted to know. And there was not like, I mean, literally like, can a black person play checkers with a white person? This was illegal in some states. Um, can black and white people share the same break room? This is illegal in some states. Um, there were, can black people park in a parking space that is designated for a white person's car? So when you think about that, where a white person could cross those boundaries, could go through life knowing no matter where they went, they had access, it was open, the world was created for them. Um, we always were constrained. It didn't matter your academic pedigree, it didn't matter where you came from, didn't, no, nothing mattered except that you were assigned black. I love your website and I love the pull out quote that you have, which says, I see my work as forcing us to confront our hypocrisy, forcing us to confront the truth that we would rather ignore. And I, I notice that even our hypocrisy is like bolded and underlined. And I, um, I think we've all noticed that like very inclusive language of our hypocrisy versus white people's hypocrisy or upper middle class hypocrisy explain a little bit about why you're using such broad inclusive language and in something that I think a lot of people could argue I don't see how you're being hypocritical Nicole like this is like white people's problem like they need to get get it is, it is no I know but then why are you saying ours yeah so um as I would hope that all of us as we learn more as we age that our thinking on things also shifts mm -hmm. and uh I definitely, definitely think this is white people's problem. Mm -hmm. uh, white people created segregation, they created racial caste, they benefit from it, um, they continue to enforce it. And it is not fair to expect mm -hmm. 
really the first generation of black people who can actually guarantee a quality education for their kids to give that up. And also understanding black people have uh, the lowest rates of maintaining social mobility. Uh, we're actually more likely to fall out of the middle class than to remain um, in the middle class, our children. So the stakes are very, very high. Um, so there's a host of reasons why black folks should not have to bear the burden. And initially, that was my argument. Um, but the longer I've spent reporting this, um, I realized that we also bear some responsibility for abandoning the most vulnerable in our communities. Mm -hmm. And if we as black folks who have gained some semblance of privilege think that white people are gonna come for our kids, mm -hmm. we're being delusional. Mm -hmm. White folks aren't gonna save our kids. I think, you know, I'm, the very first school desegregation case in the country is in 1849 in Boston, mm -hmm. which tells you how long mm -hmm. we've been waiting for white people to do the right thing for our kids. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I say our because there is, I don't know that hypocrisy when, you, when it comes to black folks is probably the right word, because I don't think, you know, black, black people are not abandoning these schools for the same reason as white people are. They're not right. abandoning these schools because they're scared of black kids. Right. Um, yeah. They're not going to these schools because they understand the ramifications for their own kids are going to these mm -hmm. schools. But I also just can't let us mm -hmm. off the hook that easy. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a consequence to the choices that middle class black people make about our kids. Mm -hmm. And the one thing about segregation, uh, when segregation was legal, was that schools were racially segregated, but they were uh, economically diverse. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. you had mm -hmm a middle-class presence in black schools. You had a presence of college educated, particularly in the South, uh, black folks in schools with poor black children. And now uh, the typical black public school student attends a school where majority of kids are low income as well as black. Um, so that's why. Uh, I just think um, we all have a role to play and while it is, again, unfair to tell black folks to fix a system they didn't create. Mm -hmm. It is not unfair to tell black folks that we need to bear responsibility for our own children. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why. Mm -hmm. um, and so even, it's funny because I used to know how my book was going to end. Mm -hmm. Now I don't know how my book is going to end. Mm -hmm. um, I know it's not gonna end on a hopeful note, but. <laughs> spoiler, <laughs> this is spoiler alert. <laughs> If you haven't followed my work, this should not be a surprise Everybody to you. drink. Right? Yes. Um, yes. But it's funny, I, I, I'm, I become less and less clear about what I'm arguing for. Mm. Because I think having the experience with my own daughter's school right. and seeing uh, the things that white parents said about the kids in our school, mm -hmm. um, seeing this school where my daughter has never been in a school where most of the kids weren't black and brown, mm -hmm. where all of her teachers are black and brown, mm -hmm. where culturally every day in that school she is affirmed. Um, mm -hmm. But I also know what she's not getting academically, I can make up for her and the other mm -hmm. parents in that school cannot. But then when I think about, you know, we had a group of white parents who came in at the beginning of the year to kindergarten and immediately began making certain demands and expected mm -hmm. that their children were going to be treated better than other kids in the school, that they could have an extra teacher for their kids and they wanted to fundraise for an extra teacher just for their kids. And they wanted their kids in their own classrooms together away from the rest of our kids. And the more I think about, like I don't want integration if integration means our kids have to be demeaned. Right. And I don't believe in integration at all, any cost, if that means that, you know, like my own experience where I was one of a handful of black kids in a white school, that's not integration either. Mm -hmm. Going to a school every day that you don't feel is your school right. mm -hmm. is not integration mm -hmm. either. And so I, I, I just don't even, I don't want to say I don't know what I'm arguing for, because I, I, yeah. I also understand that um, as long as black kids are separated, yeah. that separation is never benign, yeah. that separation always precludes a denial of resources, it, it's, it is a stamping of racial caste, our kids know it. Um, but I don't know that we can ever provide equitable integration either. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know what's the right thing. And I think that's probably uh, 
the hardest truth about America yeah. is that uh, there's a quote. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be able to say it right, but it was by um, this abolitionist in the 1700s, and he's basically like, you know, if your if your foundation is corrupt, mm -hmm. right, everything you build on top of it is yeah. corrupt, yeah. and we import the first Africans to be mm -hmm. enslaved. Mm -hmm. 12 years after right. we landed Jamestown. Right. So we can't rid ourselves of that. Yeah. And it, it corrupts everything after. Yeah. So even when we try to do the right thing, yeah. black kids are still going to lose out some way. Mm -hmm. And so I think it, it's it's become increasingly hard for me to figure out what's mm -hmm. the right answer, except, you know, blow the whole shit up and start, <laughs> start over, which I can't yeah. really advocate for. <laughs> uh, armed revolution, no. Uh, I'm not advocating for that. Where's the camera? <laughs> Just to be clear, but I do, I do think if you look at history, the the, the times where we have made the most strides That's towards right. mm -hmm. recognizing the full That's humanity right. and citizenship of Black people right. has only come after revolution. That's yeah. right. And you know, the, mm -hmm. the second revolution being the civil, uh, the civil war, mm -hmm. and the third revolution being the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And so I think expecting um, that we will somehow have equality without yeah. that. I'm not arguing for revolution, but yeah. I'm just saying if you well, study history, right. yeah. I'd be okay with yeah. it is clear. Can you imagine what a restructuring might look like or a mass movement towards education? Let's say we actually got serious about this. <laughs> what revolutionary ideas would we be for if we were serious about education? Yeah, so one, if we were serious about education, we'd actually fund it. Mm -hmm. So we, in a capitalist country, show what we value by what we pay for. Right. Mm -hmm. right. And as schools have become more black and brown, mm -hmm. you can just go down the line and see that school funding has also declined. Mm -hmm. um, I also think we should abolish private schools. Mm -hmm. The private schools should not exist. If we believe, so when, in, when the Supreme Court rules in Brown v. Board of Education, it rules that education is one of the most important functions of government. Mm -hmm. Though there is no constitutional right to an education. Not federally. Mm -hmm. um, so I think if we actually believe that education is the most important thing for our, our citizens in order for us to be able to exercise our role in a democratic republic, um, that we should eliminate the ability to flee the public good and just, if everyone, this is, this is why integration works, right? This is why we initially as a country decided we wanted to have common schools, was understanding that when our fates are tied together, That's right. yes. Mm -hmm. Certain shit just can't happen, right? Right. right? right. If my kid's in that school, mm -hmm. you best believe right. that school's gonna have certain things. Yes. But if my kid's not in that school, I don't care what happens over there as right. much as I say that I do. So I think if you eliminated the ability to just flee public schools, then clearly we would fund them yeah. and we would ensure a high quality education for all kids. Mm. Uh, and I also think uh, we need to absolutely eliminate um, funding schools by local property tax mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. because. Yes. That is just built in yeah. Yeah. inequality. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Uh, I spend, you know, my book is my book is about the whole country, but the main narrative of my book is Detroit. Right. Mm. What you find is in these heavily black, poor cities, black folks vote again and again to raise taxes yeah. on themselves. They have some of the highest tax rates in the whole country yeah. because they want to provide quality education for their kids. Yeah. But a very high tax rate on a home that's worth mm -hmm. two thousand right. dollars. Mm -hmm produces nothing yes. right that's right meanwhile you can move out to the suburbs and you could have a stingy ass tax rate mm -hmm. on properties that are worth a lot of money mm -hmm. and raise a ton of money for your schools mm -hmm. so i think we absolutely need to if we were serious we'd eliminate funding schools by local property tax right. we would get rid of that that built-in inequality and the incentive to uh segregate our schools and the final thing that we would do so one, if you eliminate public schools, every kid's going to a, or private schools, every kid's going to a public school. Mm -hmm. You eliminate the ability to, to move into a rich white place and get more funding for your kids. Mm -hmm. right. And the final thing that you have to do is eliminate all of these school districts that serve a single county. So mm -hmm. if you think about Chicago metropolitan right. area, yeah. how many school districts are there? Yeah. So you can avoid integration and equality simply by moving five miles up the road yeah. into an exclusive white community. Yeah. The reason that school desegregation was so effective in the South is the South, mostly because it was a more agrarian, mm -hmm. developed countywide school systems. Right. Mm -hmm. And so when a school system came under a desegregation order, 
it covered the entire county, which meant the desegregation order covered the city, the suburbs, mm -hmm. and the rural communities. Mm -hmm. What happened in the North, Chicago was placed under a desegregation right. order, but none of its suburbs were. Right. So white folks who didn't want to integrate just moved. Just moved. Yeah. Right. It actually incentivized white flight. Right. So you would also then have to collapse these school district boundaries and create mm -hmm. metropolitan-wide school districts. Mm -hmm. If you did those three things, mm -hmm. it would change the face of yeah. education. It wouldn't fix everything yeah. because as we also know in integrated schools there's tracking of kids right. so white kids get the upper level classes right. black yeah. kids get the lower level yeah. but it would fix a lot That's of the so structural right. problems yeah. and that interior tracking is much easier to fix than right. the disparities right. that we see outside yeah. of the schools mm -hmm. um, those are three radical things that you could do mm -hmm. i imagine we would do none of them i like having an answer though yeah. i know but i don't That's like it's for, living in the unknown we know right. what to do yeah. right, right. Yeah. the thing right. is we hear all the time that public schools are broken right the, the typical public school that a white kid attends is not broken. Right. Yeah. right. Now, there are certainly white kids who are, who are attending very shitty schools, and depending on the state, yeah. Oklahoma, mm -hmm. uh, West Virginia, mm -hmm. they're not funding schools even for white kids well mm -hmm. there. But typically, the schools that white kids attend, they are doing fine. We yeah. know how to educate kids. Mm -hmm. uh, we just have to have the will to do it and to mm -hmm. actually believe that black and brown kids are deserving of yeah. an equal education. One of the things I think that makes me, okay, and everything makes me angry, so I can't say it makes me the most angry because a lot of shit makes me angry. But people are like, oh, we just need more technology in black schools. White kids' parents are not asking for their kid to sit on a computer all day and learn. Mm -hmm. right. right? White kids' aren't, parents aren't like, oh, get an iPad in my kid's school. Mm -hmm. White kids' parents want a teacher. That's mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. And they want lessons, That's right. and they want science labs, right. and they want textbooks, right? So all these things that if we think to solve, yeah. and I don't believe in saying like look to white people for the answers, right. but in a system built on racial caste, you see how the top of caste is treated, right. and you That's understand right. that this is then what is desirable for your own right. children. Right. So those are the things. We know exactly what to do. We know how to mm -hmm. teach our kids. There's a reason why immigrants want to come here right. to attend our schools, right? right? We know what to yeah. do. Yeah. We just refuse to do it. Yeah. And I think that is clearly all of my work and my mission in life is to one, force us to confront the fact that we're choosing That's this, right. That's right. but to also say we can make another choice. Yes. This is not an unsolvable problem. That's right. We just, our schools are doing what we want them to do. Nicole, how do you do this? <laughs> I say this jokingly. Uh, I don't think I have a healthy... I really don't think I have a healthy way of dealing with it. Mm -hmm. And my husband was certainly saying <laughs> <laughs> he bears the brunt of, uh, mm. no, I mean, it's yeah. not, it's not easy. It is actually, I think, I think all reporters who cover hardship, yeah. uh, it takes a toll on them, yeah. but it's, it's distinct when that hardship is your own community. Yeah. It's a distinct when you pers like you're personalizing it because these stories are the stories of your family and That's your right. people. And so there's not the ability to have a separation. Mm -hmm. So I know, you know, a lot of journalists who cover war, cover these things, they're like, you know, they can they can mm -hmm. remove themselves from mm -hmm. it. But I go home to a black community, right. to my black family. Right. I can't. There's no separation. It's all personal. Um and it's really hard, and I learn, I mean, I'm constantly reading about this, and mostly history, and it's like, I've been studying this since I was in high school, mm -hmm. and I still learn new, right. atrocious right. shit yep. mm -hmm. every two days. Yep. Mm. Um, and then I think the, the other hard part is just then interacting daily with other people who can just be completely oblivious right. to it. Yep. Yes. And that... Just oblivious, but proudly oblivious. Right, right. So you know, it's like I, yeah, I, I don't, I don't have a good coping mechanism. I don't mm -hmm. know how to cope with. I study mm -hmm. history because, on the one hand, history always calmed me, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. when I was a kid and I wanted to understand this world that seemed so disjointed, like mm -hmm. that this perception of who we were didn't match the reality, mm -hmm. 
And then studying history, I, it, it's like, oh, it makes sense. It at least lets you know you're not crazy. You're not like making things I'm up. I'm not crazy right? and we're not who <laughs> right. they say we are, right? Right. right. Which was very important to me. Yeah. Um, and that we had a legacy one, like history teaches you like, there's no shame in our slavery. That's right. Mm. But we're That's taught right. to be ashamed of that. That's right. And history teaches us that our black folks history predates slavery too. Hello. Mm. You know, even like the first Africans who were brought to the United States or what would become the United States came from c urban cities. Yep. They were highly advanced in Angola. Mm -hmm. But you don't learn you don't any of this history, history right? right? So like history to me was always empowering and calming. Yeah. But it also is like, I can't ever be rid of it. So I come to Chicago and I'm like, I can tell you the history of segregation. I can tell you the history of yeah. like, uh, redlining, like every city I go, the first thing I think about yeah. is the racial history of that city. Yeah. And sometimes my husband's like, "Can we just fucking and like, <laughs> can we just look at Niagara Falls and enjoy the pristine beauty, right? Like, I don't actually need to hear what they did to black people, okay? So I, but I can't, like, I can't do that. Yeah. I don't have the ability to do that, and yeah. and I, I wish that I did because it's it's probably not healthy. Like, yeah. Sometimes some of my close friends are like, you know, we need to be around to do this for a long time. So you need to like get your life together. After that uh, piece uh, on death, sex, and money, yes. I got so many texts from friends who are like, bitch, go back to counseling. <laughs> Let me, let, me give you, like, let me give you the name right. of some folks to call. A one. And at first it was like the first three, it was right. funny. And then I was like, okay, now y'all start making serious. <laughs> <laughs> folks are not playing with me. But yeah. An intervention with I mean, how do y'all cope with shit? Like, what, how do you cope like, with it? Counseling. I, I go to therapy like once a week and I, I will say it's like dating you gotta find the right that's person that's everyone says who the fuck I haven't dated since I was 23 <laughs> I don't got time for that shit I'm with you Nicole I don't and I'm gonna do so what's nice. um what's that swimmer's name who's who's uh, advertising that date that um counseling oh, app or some yes. texting? Oh, yeah. yeah. Can you counsel by text? No. Yes. You, well, I that think you can. Not for you. Yeah. Not for what you're doing. Oh. <laughs> you need some like day like yeah. all day intensive retreats. Oh damn. Okay. Well, maybe just start with like you well, yeah, know. an hour session. But I do think I think it's important to find. For me, it was important to find a black woman who yeah. could understand my mm -hmm. existence because there's some things you just, I don't, I can't explain to you what it's like to walk mm -hmm. in the skin right. every day. Right. And you certainly can't spend money to no, right. just no. Okay, let me yeah. teach you how to help exactly. me. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So I needed that. And that was, you know, and I know people that, you know, other black women who don't do that. But for me, that was really important. But I went, I was going through like, just like a year where I was like, okay, I need to go to counseling. But then after that, I was like, you know what? I just need to do this because mm -hmm. even when I don't think something's wrong, like yeah. I'll go in and I'm like, oh, I didn't realize I was carrying, because we carry so mm -hmm. much yeah. weight all the time. And also my body just started shutting down on me. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it I realized was stress and just stuff that I wasn't processing yeah. because we just keep going. Mm -hmm. So not to be one more person to say, but I just, you know. <laughs> Chi Chi's sitting right. in judgment I now. Mean, Sometimes I say bourbon is my therapy, that. but that doesn't go over well. But I also, I drink bourbon too. That is also helpful. You could do both. You bourbon, you know what you should try is bourbon <laughs> and counseling. Yeah. Bring bourbon to the counselor. To the counselor. Right. I mean, counseling on top of counseling. That's how you'll know you found the right one. When they're like, right, when right, you when drink they're bourbon like, together. <laughs> when they start drinking with you, maybe that'll be the. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I feel like that's just going out with my girlfriend. Yeah, you don't want to do that. There that's is a true. there is that relationship. And but I do think being a black woman in America and just trying to exist as your full self is exhausting, but it's also an act of resistance because and resistance is exhausting, you know, in itself. So anytime we're showing up, even if we're like strong and we believe that I know I'm supposed to be here, there's still a little bit of like work mm -hmm. to fully show up. At least for me because I'm like and but you know what? Resistance is also liberating. Right? Yeah, it is. And because when I, the reason I can do that is because I've seen other people okay. do it. And I realized, like, my hair, like, I realized, like, for yeah. the longest time, I was like, it's got to be straight. It's got to look like this for me to, mm -hmm. you know, to to, succeed, to do well. To be accepted. And yeah, then I thought, I remember yeah. seeing my, yeah. the first executive, I was thinking, and she had her hair in braids, and I was like, mm. oh, you can. I you didn't know you could do that. Do that? Like, yeah. And she was just, like, herself, and I was like, Oh, okay. That's what I want because yeah. mm -hmm. that, like you said, that's freedom, you know. And in and, and a little bit, but like I get to like step into that. But I think, and I think about that for myself when I, 
show up in spaces where I'm like, okay, I don't know who's around me, but maybe there's somebody else that needs to see that and know like that's okay. And I feel that way with you. Like when I, you know, I saw your Twitter bio, you know, I like, I think you were talking in an interview about how you just, you are who you are wherever you go. And I'm like, yes, I don't need to code switch to be in the space because I'm good at what I do. I know that and I can show up with that because white supremacy tells me I should look a certain way, talk a certain way, but that's bondage, you know? And I, I am the way that I am because this is how I was created. So, you know. I mean, think about the fact that some places are having to pass legislation that says, you can't discriminate against black women for wearing their natural right. fucking hair. Right. Right. Like the, the hair, hair that literally sprouts right. from your head, there has to be laws passed yes. for this. Um, I tell like young folks all the time that you have to make a choice. Mm -hmm. And you can make a choice to conform or not to conform. Mm -hmm. You have to do what you can live with. Yeah. But I'm also like not gonna sell them a dream. Mm -hmm. And I tell them by like not conforming, trust, like you actually might not make it. Right. And I think that's important to be honest yeah. as well. Yeah. You know, like a lot of young folks look at me and they feel very liberated. And they're like, oh my God, like you, you wear hair and your nails mm -hmm. and like how you dress and how you speak. And they're like, I, same thing that you said when you saw that executive, mm -hmm. right? And they're like, oh, I didn't know you could work at the Times and do that. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, but look how many people at the times are like right. me. Right. Mm. Right. Right. Yeah. Mostly you can't. Yeah. 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 And I think that that is also important because yeah. we have to like give folks mm. a realistic mm. idea of what this means. Right. Um, and what I always say, I, I say this to black parents and I just say this in general, if you're black, there will be a struggle with which one. Well, right. 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 There's not an existence where there isn't one. Right. So for me, it's like my struggle was I, I'm from Waterloo, Iowa. I was never supposed to be in any of the spaces I'm in, so I'm not that invested. So mm. I just couldn't, I couldn't not be me. Yeah. But I also had very strong odds I wasn't going to get where I am. Mm. And I made that choice. And other folks really want to get where they want right. to be. Right. And so their choice is that they're going to tone themselves down. Mm -hmm. So all these things are a struggle, but it's mm. which, which one do you choose? And for I me, to, yeah. I think I've had to redefine what it means to make it, mm -hmm. right? So does making it mean becoming the CEO or mm -hmm. does making it mean producing my own shit? That's right. Mm -hmm. Nicole, can you tell us about the book project you're working on? Um, it's past due. <laughs> All the good ones are. That's what exactly. I'm told. But a lot of bad ones are too, so. Oh, yours is uh, a good one. Yours, 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 yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so I, I have literally written tens of thousands of words on school segregation, yet still didn't feel like I was able to write enough. Uh, so I'm working on a book called The Problem We All Live With, which is named after the Norman Rockwell painting of Ruby Bridges attempting to become the black, first black child in the South to uh, attend a white school. Um, and the book is about school segregation uh, in the entire country, going all the way back to slavery, basically making the argument that when it comes to black kids, our schools are not broken, but operating as designed. Mm -hmm. That you know, black folks are the only people in the history of the United States for whom it was illegal to read and rights for whom it was illegal to get an education. Mm -hmm. And even at the founding of common schools in the country when um, Horace Mann, considered the father of the public school, has his vision of publicly funded common schools, he makes a compromise that in order to get white popular support for public education, mm -hmm. he must exclude black children. Mm -hmm. And so, and of course that's Boston. Mm -hmm. So no matter what part of the country you were in, there was not a belief that black children should be educated initially at all. Um, because education leads to resistance, mm -hmm. and education allows one to compete economically, and schools were about building citizens, and black kids mm -hmm. were not considered citizens. And so I'm arguing that with that framework and foundation, the fact that to this day, black children still do not receive an equal and quality education mm -hmm. is because our schools were never designed to ensure that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we appreciate that work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I appreciate y'all's work. Can you tell us a little bit about the Ida B. Wells investigative system? Absolutely. There she is. There she yes. is. Yes. Um, so uh, the Ida B. Wells Society is an organization that I helped co-found in 2016. And um, 
we exist to help try to train and create more investigative reporters of color. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we exist is we clearly, uh, you know, the First Amendment to the Constitution is about the right to a free press. Mm -hmm. And we understand in this country that the most valuable tool for holding our democracy accountable is a free press. Mm -hmm. And investigative reporting is the highest level of press because investigative reporting is that which reveals the way that powerful people wield their power mm -hmm. against vulnerable people yeah. and unearths corruption and holds our elected officials and other power brokers accountable. It is also the whitest mm -hmm. field of reporting mm -hmm. because it follows the same hierarchies that you see in society. Mm -hmm. These are the most prestigious positions. Investigative reporting costs the most money because it tends to take a very long time. Mm -hmm. And so it's very hard uh, for black and brown journalists to get into those positions. Um, and the myself and our co-founders understand personally how hard it was to get in those positions because no one saw any of us as, as investigative reporters. We kind of had to make our own way. Right. So we were at a um, investigative reporting conference mm -hmm. in 2015 and looked around. I had only met two of our co-founders that day. But, you know, when you're black mm -hmm. folks in a white space, Listen, you, find each other. <laughs> you may not have shit else in common, <laughs> but you're going to be friends, right? So we are all like having drinks in the lobby and we're looking around and we're like, we're like 95% of the black people at this conference and we're 95% of the black people at all these investigative conferences. Mm -hmm. And we just decided at that moment we're gonna do something about it. Wow. We're tired of waiting mm. for these organizations who keep bringing their hands right. and saying, oh, we wish, right. we wish we could find more diversity, but we just can't. Because we knew, like, we wanted to be investigative reporters. Right. We knew lots of folks who wanted to do investigative reporting but didn't have the support. So uh, we decided to found this organization. We named it after Ida B. Wells. Uh, one, because she's the most boss-ass chick in American yes. history. Um, but also because we wanted to tie into a legacy and show, like, this is not, black folks doing investigative reporting is not new. Not right. new. I and Ida that. B. Wells was an innovator. She was a That's data right. journalist. That's right. right. Like, she innovated reporting techniques that we still use That's to this right. day, yeah. even though she was largely written out of that story. Mm -hmm. So we decided to name our organization after her to tie into this legacy, but also to show, like, this is the work that we have been doing mm -hmm. and at the top of our game. Um, and it's been uh, one of the hardest things I've done because I've never started or run an organization in my life and I, you know, all of us already have full-time jobs, but it's been some of the most fulfilling. Our trainings always sell out, um, which clearly, and, and we charge very little, like our, our whole point is to make this accessible, right. Yeah. Right. to provide the best top quality training, but also to show journalists of color it is important that they're trained by journalists of color because mm -hmm. it's not surprising to see white men teaching you investigative reporting. Right. What I needed to see was someone like me right. doing this work. Yes. And what younger or even established journalists need to see is someone like them doing this work. Um, and the you know amount of people who want to be trained just tells me that this desire has been there, but the opportunity mm -hmm. has not. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's been great. Uh, anyone who's interested, IWLsociety.org. We always take donations. Um, <laughs> yeah. But we also offer trainings all over the country. Okay. We're training people to be trainers. Mm -hmm. um, and we pay because uh, mm -hmm. we don't believe in free labor. It's enough yeah. of that. Mm -hmm. um, but we're really just trying to expand. And I guess the last thing I'll say on this is the reason why it matters is there's just stories that don't get covered mm -hmm. if we're not doing investigative reporting. Mm -hmm. And the best example I can, recent example I can give is you can look at police killings, That's right? right. Anybody who's lived in a black neighborhood know that, that black people are regularly abused by the police. Mm -hmm. But these police killings were happening and mainstream newsrooms were just giving the police side of the That's story right. and That's not right. investigating. That's right. And what it took was social media, yeah. regular citizens That's right. posting mm -hmm. videos That's that right. counteract the police narrative. Mm -hmm. That's how we find out about Michael That's Brown. Yeah. That's how we find out about Walter Scott. Yeah. That's how we find yeah. out about Eric Garner. That's right. Not from reporters right. asking questions, That's right? right? Wow. And so when those citizens go and start posting these videos, it forces the media to start reporting. Right. And then we saw, I mean, now we're not reporting on it again, mm -hmm. but we saw two years of very intensive right. scrutiny. Right. Matter of fact, a piece in the Washington, you know, a project in the Washington Post wins the Pulitzer. Right. Mm -hmm. Looking at this. Mm -hmm. But the only reason that happens is because people of color start posting yeah. videos on their own. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you have black and brown investigative reporters That's in those right. newsrooms, 
-hmm. They're asking those questions and they're telling those stories. So that is why it is critical for us to be there. Not for some PC bullshit, but because it actually makes the reporting better and because we're gonna see and tell stories that white journalists simply miss. That's good, that's good. We don't know how to address the fact that this stuff is still in the air. People tell the story like Dr. King preached the I have a dream speech and then ascended it into heaven. <laughs> Especially in anti-racism work, I say black women are 100% experts regardless. Yes. I'm deeply invested in building movements where folks aren't shamed for not coming out of the womb, understanding cis patriarchal violence. Prison isn't addressing yeah. trauma, it's yeah. not addressing violence. Prison is a place of trauma and violence. Everything in the news is just like beating us down. I want to see stories about black women succeeding and thriving. Black folks in a white space. Listen, you find each other. <laughs> you may not have shit else in common, <laughs> but you're gonna be friends, right? warm-up questions. I really... <laughs> <laughs> I was like, hell, we're here. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching our first episode of The Next Question. A special shout out to all of our Kickstarter backers. Thank you so much for your support. Um, we really hope that you enjoyed this episode and make sure that you go to tnqshow.com for homework um, and for other fun things. Thanks so much and we'll see you next week.